700 years ago, in June 1314, two armies clashed here, just to the south of Stirling. It's the site of Scotland's most famous and iconic battle against the English, Bannockburn. Just down there is a statue of the man who led the Scots to victory. Against all the odds, Robert the Bruce fought off the English in an epic two-day battle. <laughs> It was an almighty clash, Bruce's spearmen fighting for independence, up against the mighty army of Edward II, intent on suppressing once and for all their unruly northern neighbour. No one has ever managed to precisely locate the battlefield, and that's the quest that we've set ourselves. Together with a team of the country's most experienced archaeologists, we're going to search for evidence of this elusive battle. We'll call on the help of the British Army and the local people of Bannockburn to help track down the site. And we also want to find out just how Robert the Bruce was able to secure a victory over one of the most effective fighting forces in the whole of the medieval world. An army of experienced combat fighters combined with a visual effects team will help us understand how Robert the Bruce's army crushed the English. No, there's the panic bird coming in, right? That's where 8,000 Scots and twice as many English fought to the death. Hard to imagine today. Dawn on Midsummer's Day. Back in 1314, the English army, led by Edward II, had spent a restless night on the plain near Stirling Castle, in anticipation of the next day's battle with the Scots army. I've had nowhere near enough sleep yet. When you're getting up at dawn, it's, just, it's hardly worth going to bed. No, I just feel rough. <clears throat> I wonder how much sleep was actually had on the night in, in your question. Rest. <laughs> Not much if you were in your armour, I guess. Mm. That must have been uncanny. It's funny to think about thousands of men and some women all sleeping rough out here. If you'd looked out across this landscape, it would all have been little smudgy fires, wouldn't it? Little beacons of hope. Good, right. Battlefield won't find itself now, will it? Nobody finds what we don't find now. No, well, not the way we don't find it. <sighs> the Battle of Bannockburn was fought over two days. On day one, the English army led by Edward II arrived on June the 23rd, 1314. Their goal was to relieve Stirling Castle, which was the only major Scottish stronghold left in English hands. But at stake that day was more than just a castle. It was a battle to determine Scotland's status as an independent kingdom and Robert the Bruce's right to rule it. Standing in the way of Edward's army was the much smaller Scottish force. But Robert the Bruce had prepared well. Positioned beside pits lined with sharp wooden stakes, Bruce had trained his men to form shiltrons. These medieval hedgehogs were large formations of tightly packed men armed with spears. Impenetrable by cavalry, Bruce's shilterns held firm against the first English cavalry charge. With the road to Stirling Castle blocked, Edward's commanders were forced to find somewhere to camp that night. The Battle of Bannockburn was one of the most important battles fought on Scottish soil. To understand how Bruce managed to crush Edward's superior forces on day two, we need to find out where the two armies clashed but the exact location of the battle has never been found. 
To help us track down the location, we've come to the Bannockburn Visitor Centre. Oh, look at that. It's amazing, isn't it? Here, the National Trust for Scotland have turned back the clock and created a historically accurate map of Stirling's landscape at the time of the battle. So, we're now back in 1314. Uh -huh. So, by the end of the first day, what is the situation? Well, the English have come up from the south along the Roman road, mm -hmm. heading toward the castle, which they are trying to relieve the siege of. Mm -hmm. The English have failed to break through along the road. With the direct route to Stirling Castle blocked, Edward's army was forced to turn east towards a big flat plain called the Cars. Here, he decided to camp for the night and prepared for battle the next day. So, the sun rises on the second day and that's the battle, the full-scale clash. Question is, where did that battle take place? What do the chronicles offer in terms of clues about the location of the big battle? Well, we've got four of the accounts. Barber's the Bruce, which uh -huh. is the epic poem about the life of Robert Bruce, a Scottish source. We've got the Scala Chronica, the eyewitness account of an English knight captured by the Scots, but written from a Scottish perspective, really. Mm -hmm. Then we've got the Chronicle of Lanacost, which comes from the Abbey in the north of England, so an English account. And then we've got the biography of Edward II. Okay. So again, obviously English. And is there, as it were, common ground in the Four Chronicles saying where the fighting took place? Good question. The Scala Chronica, for instance, describes that flat plain as a deep, wet marsh, which would suggest rather unpleasant altogether. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other accounts are perhaps a little kinder to it. Um, they describe it as a, as a broad field and a dry field. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is, if you're describing dry ground, mm -hmm. even today, this area of Upland is traditionally known as the dry field. Okay. So, unfortunately for us, the possibility that that brings about is that we've got two possible locations for the battle, either on the low ground or on the high ground. Mm -hmm. It's really quite important, I think, that we settle the argument as to which one of those two it is. From the air, the two main contenders for the battlefield are clear to see. Look at that landscape. You can see the real difference in the terrain. You've got the higher ground, the place to call the dry field, rising up there, and then the very low flat ground of the cars, uh -huh. with the rivers running their way through it. On the high ground is the dry field, now the site of Bannockburn High School. Down the wooded slope, east of the school's playing fields, is the Cars, a huge open expanse of ground. You've got Bruce on the high ground, he's definitely got the guerrilla advantage up there. Yeah. But if Edward brings his army down here and backs off, he's got plenty of room for manoeuvre. You can see what's happening, you can see if the Scots start to approach him. Together, the high ground and the Cars represent a huge area to search. Archaeologists from the Centre for Battlefield Archaeology at Glasgow University will work alongside a team from the National Trust for Scotland and metal detecting groups from all over the country. The search for Bannockburn will be meticulously carried out because up until now, no confirmed evidence of the battle has ever been found. Don't see any spelling mistakes? And we've got the Chuckle Brothers down at the bottom. OK, well, let's print it. Yep, great. Good. OK. But to cover the area thoroughly, we're going to need an army of volunteers to augment the professionals. That's it. Lovely. OK. OK, thanks for that, Brian. Yeah, totally. Cheers. OK, thanks now. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs> it's the morning of the big day, and over 100 local recruits have arrived. Our army of volunteers will investigate both the main candidates for the location of the battle. Today, we've set ourselves quite a stiff challenge. We've got to be realistic. What we expect to find 
is not a great deal. You won't find any of these? No, unfortunately not. What we're going to be looking for are literally bits and pieces of weaponry that may have been smashed in the battle, fallen to the ground, and not been picked up afterwards. I hope you all have a good time, and thank you very much for coming. Yeah. And hopefully you'll still have smiles on your faces at 5 o'clock this evening. OK, thanks a lot. Now, this is what we call a big dig. Some of our teams are digging at Bray Head, which is the low-lying area on the edge of the cars. Even as a sterling local, that view of the castle from here surprises me. I'm amazed by how close we are yeah, it's to dramatic, the building. It? Check it out, Neil. Obviously in the right place. Right place. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Some Brayhead residents have opened That'll up their gardens good. to dig for clues. Now, that is the most full tray we've had so far. You've got tons of stuff. Hands up if you know when the battle was. Uh, 20,000 years ago. 20,000 years ago. It sometimes that? feels like that. Some promising objects are starting to emerge, though. It looks early, doesn't it? Sure as heck ain't plant pot. The thinner stuff is earlier than the thicker stuff, so that's thin. So that could quite easily be 14th, 15th century. So again, that could be of a period. Fantastic. Well, that's the best and biggest so far, isn't it? I've never seen so much of this stuff in the same place. We've actually got what you might call quite a lot of this now. It's, yeah, there is a lot. Thin, up. green glazed yeah, pottery there, of there. the period. Our second search area is half a mile away, up on the high ground near Bannockburn High School, which is known locally as the Dry Field. On day one, Bruce had successfully defended his position up here on the high ground overlooking the cars. If the two armies met here on day two, Edward would have had to march his whole army up the slope to engage the Scots. But so far, there haven't been any significant finds here on the high ground. And looking around, you can perhaps understand why. There is a rather obvious natural barrier. Balquhidderet Wood. Is there any way of knowing how much of a wood was here in the 14th century? There seems to be a feeling it was. Right. And that's the debate, isn't it? Because though we can't see it from here, that's a slope running down to the karst. Yeah. And does the Scottish army move downhill onto the karst to meet the English there? Or do they let the English come up here? And to my mind, that scenario just doesn't make sense. Why would you let that happen? You, you're not going to allow that, are you? Well, you're going to lose the element of actually being the force taking yeah. positive action it's, rather than just waiting okay. on it to come to you. Looking at the wood today, climbing this slope with a full army looks impossible. But were there trees on this spot 700 years ago? So while the digging continues, Tony's going to try and find out if there are any references in the archives to Balquidderup Wood. John Harrison is a historian who's made a study of the local landscape. This document is a title deed dated 1471, which describes the countryside around Bannockburn at the time. It's referring to land which lies sub Nemora de Buchadrock, that is, oh. under the wood of Balquidrock. So ah, this is after the battle. Okay. But I think it's fairly clear that much the same would have applied at the time of the battle. So the wood was there, and it would have been fairly difficult to move through. Oh, it, it, that, that, for an army, it would be completely impossible. Right. And certainly the Scots would have done all in their power to make sure that they didn't. Yeah. The advantage of controlling the heights um, would be tremendous. And Robert the Bruce had to exploit every advantage he could, as his army was seriously outnumbered. The Scots footmen numbered 7,000, while the English fielded at least 14,000 infantry and archers. And the 500 Scottish light cavalry faced 2,000 English knights on their much heavier war horses. It looks impenetrable, but could it have been done? Let's find out if Edward's famous fully laden cavalry could ride up the hill to confront the Scots. Kirsty McWilliam's horse stunt team is experienced at riding in tricky terrain. This is the hill that Edward would have had to climb with all his horsemen in all their armour if they were going to fight the Battle of Bannockburn up on the high ground at the okay. top there. There would have been trees at the time, probably not as many as this. Yeah. But what I'd like to see is how you and Seamus manage 
getting up that slope. OK, yeah, we'll give it a go. Great. No problem. So I'll leave you to pick your own way through. OK. And uh, stand out of the way. At first, Kirsty's warhorse storms up the hill. But when they reach the top part of the hill, they are forced to slow down and pick their way through the branches and boggy ground. Welcome to the high ground, Kirsty. Thank you. How was it? Well, it was a little bit of a challenge. And you're not but... even in armour? No, I'm not in armour, and I wouldn't want to be. And the thing is that if Edward was going to fight up here, he'd have to come up from the cast, up that slope, through the trees, and he'd have to do it not with one horse, but with about 2,000. Yeah, it'd be very difficult to keep any kind of formation coming through yeah, there. You'd yeah. have to pick your way through there. Yeah, it seems so unlikely that Bruce and the Scottish Army would just sit back and let them do that. And even if you led the horse up on foot, you'd still be in armour and you've still got 2,000 horses. And you'd be quite defenceless if you were to become attacked. Well done. Right, he looks as though he needs a run. I think he would. Well earned, OK. So if the English cavalry couldn't make it onto the high ground, Bruce's foot soldiers must have descended through Balkhidorik Wood and engaged the English somewhere on the cars. So the testimony of the pottery, although it doesn't necessarily place the battle there, it certainly suggests that it was a settled, habitable area. Exactly. What those pottery finds from our big dig on the cars indicate is that our dry, broad field might be the cars and not the high ground. We've actually found nothing up there. And so it would make sense that the place where the English force is likely to have camped is also the place where the battle would have taken place. It's very much looking like it. For a start, why would they camp in a bog? So it looks very much as though that is our battlefield. To prove our theory, though, we will need to find more archaeological evidence from this part of the cast. On the eve of the battle, the mood in the English camp was low. Edward and his men had assumed they would be dining in Stirling Castle, rather than sleeping rough on a midge-infested moor. The men were exhausted and hungry. According to the historical accounts, Rouse soon broke out between the king and some of his commanders. He ignored their pleas to let the men rest. But Edward had a long history of not taking counsel from his nobles. In fact, he'd rarely listened to them since he was crowned. I've crossed the border to Cumberland to find out what had caused this rift between the nobles and the king of England. Edward II has largely been written off by historians. He's been described as one of the most unsuccessful kings ever to rule England. Whether he was or whether he wasn't needn't concern us. What is important is that in the years leading up to Bannockburn, Robert the Bruce was able to exploit the civil war that Edward was obliged to wage against his nobles. Civil wars during the Middle Ages were too a penny. But what made this one infamous was its cause. The controversial relationship between Edward II and a minor noble, Piers Gaveston. Piers Gaveston was exiled from the realm because, as the Lanarkost Chronicle records, of the improper familiarity which my Lord Edward the Younger entertained with him, speaking of him openly as his brother. This remarkable story is told in the Chronicle of Lanarkost, written here at the Lanarkost Priory, south of Carlisle. The Chronicle tells how, after his father Edward I died, Edward II recalled his friend from exile and lavished many gifts of money, gold, titles and land on Gaveston. When this was done, the whole of England murmured against the king and was indignant against the aforesaid peers. Edward was a man born in the wrong time, 
and he went too far. He broke the codes of a society that might have tolerated his love for a man, but that detested the man with whom he fell in love. His relationship with Piers Gaveston infuriated the barons and almost tore the kingdom apart. The barons became so preoccupied with this upstart from France that 12 leading nobles got together and drew up a long list of grievances against Edward. Gosh, they do go on a bit, don't they? Called the Ordinances. The, the, the last member in here. Right. There we are, that's the end. The really important clause is this one about Piers de Gaveston. <laughs> what does it say about him? <laughs> it says that he's dreadful. What were the ordainers particularly exercised about? I think they were exercised above all um, by Piers Gaveston and the problem that he presented and the threat that he presented to royal patronage. He was getting hold of royal lands, he was sending treasure abroad to Gascony. In general terms, uh, he was effectively disinheriting uh, the realm. How did the, the saga of the ordinances affect preparations for Scotland? Bruce would have been well aware of this, would have realised that Edward was in a difficult and weak position, and that would have boosted certainly his morale. He would have felt um, quite confident, I think. Edward II grudgingly agreed to the main demand of the ordainers and banished Gaveston from his kingdom. But his absence proved too much for Edward to bear. Three months later, Gaveston sneaked back into England. Fairly unusual way to enter a castle. Extremely, yeah. Edward put as much distance as he could between the ordainers and his friend. They came here to Knaresborough Castle, which Edward had given to Piers as a gift. But ironically, the only place Edward thought Gaveston would be truly safe was Scotland so he tried to make a deal with Robert the Bruce. How much do we know about Edward's attempts to gain from Robert the Bruce promises relating to Gaveston's safety? So according to a contemporary chronicle called the Vita Edwardi Secundi, which means the life of Edward II, Edward made this quite incredible promise uh, that he would recognise Robert Bruce as King of Scots if Bruce would give Piers Gaveston refuge in Scotland. This is absolutely amazing. That means that his concern for his friend mm. uh, was more important to him really than the political situation absolutely, regarding his kingdom. Absolutely, this is, this is a sign that Edward was willing to do anything at all to protect Piers Gaveston. In April 1312, the ordainers decided on military action. They formed an alliance and headed north to prevent Gaveston escaping to Scotland. But Robert the Bruce said no. Two weeks later, Gaveston was captured and imprisoned. Edward tried to broker his friend's release, but the ordainers were determined the pair should never set eyes on each other again. Gaveston was taken to Warwick Castle, where he was tried and declared an enemy of the king and his people. He was taken to a hill nearby and executed. To mark the site of the execution, a monument was built. What a strange forgotten little place. Yes, this is Gaveston's Cross. Right. What an atmospheric place, huh? Oh well, my, it just gets more and more peculiar. Indeed, yeah. Look at that. In the hollow of this rock was beheaded Piers Gaveston, Earl of Cornwall the minion of a hateful king, in life and death a memorable instance of misrule. That is a very strange memorial. There's a story about a long delay between his death and eventual burial. Yeah, that's three years afterwards, one year after Bannockburn essentially, so that's quite a long time, isn't it? Three years? Mm. So that would have been a, a continuing sore for Edward, the fact that Indeed. this person yeah, that he loved um... Was exactly. above ground. Imagine the emotional turmoil of waiting all that time to make sure that uh, your friend was buried in the correct and proper way. 
As Gaveston's corpse lay festering, it became a symbol of division between Edward and his nobles. When the king heard of the slaughter of peers, he flared up in anger and gave all his thoughts to the means whereby he might avenge himself to the slaves. Two years later, Edward was given the chance. Bannockburn. Edward marched north intent on relieving Stirling Castle. Defeating Robert the Bruce would re-establish his authority. So in a sense, Bannockburn was as much of an opportunity for Edward as it was for the Bruce. It was an opportunity to avenge Gaveston's murder, his execution. A glorious victory would give Edward back the upper hand. It would restore his prestige and his status. Perhaps more than anything else, it would curb the ambitions of the ordainers, force them to submit to the king's will. But Edward's belief his opponents would unite behind the campaign against Scotland was soon dashed. A handful of the ordainers, some of England's most powerful nobles, adamantly refused to join the king. If they had joined with Edward on that day, then the story of Bannockburn might have been quite different. Edward's come north with an English army led by his nobles. But some of those guys are missing, aren't they? There's bad blood between some of the nobles and the king because of the relationship between Gaveston and Edward. Mm -hmm. And so Lancaster, Arundel, Surrey and Warwick are conspicuous by their absence. While they send representation, the men themselves who should have been at Edward's side are not there. So we could say that Edward's not playing with his A-team? Definitely not. There's gaps in the offensive and defensive. But in the end, it wasn't a lack of men or nobles that led to Edward's downfall. His nemesis was the Bannockburn, by which he camped and which gave its name to the battle. The place where Edward had decided to camp was, at first glance, strategically sound. There was water for the horses, and the Bannockburn and another stream, the Pell Stream, surrounded him, giving him protection from surprise attacks from behind. But on the day of the battle, the Bannockburn gave anything but that, as the English forces retreated from the Scots' advance. One chronicle describes it as the watery grave for the English army. Another calamity which befell the English was that many nobles and others with their horses in the crush were never able to extricate themselves from the great ditch. Thus, Bannockburn was spoken about for many years in English throats. The Bannockburn twists and turns for many miles. The contemporary accounts all agree that somewhere along it, the battle was fought. If we can find archaeological evidence, we will be able to pinpoint where the two armies clashed on day two of the battle. Oh, this is interesting. I've never seen Stirling from the river. We are heading to where the Bannockburn flows into the River Forth. And it's when you enter the mouth of the Bannockburn that you get a very clear idea of how much of an obstacle the river would have been to a medieval army. In all the years of talking about Bannockburn, I've never been on it before. Right. It's more somewhere you talk about than somewhere you visit. It's about 50 feet wide here. I, yeah. I wonder how far we could get up it before we get grounded. I know, but it really, it feels like a river here, yeah. not a burn. You yes. wouldn't call this a burn, would you? you well, wouldn't. I wouldn't. No, it's an amazing different perspective. The drowned man's perspective. And you go, I mean, when you go in, presumably when you go into that water underfoot, it's not firm footing, it's just thick it's slime. It's mud. just slime, it's just gel. Yeah, you sink, so, you sink through it. Well, there are accounts of many of them drowning in the river and presumably the lower reaches here. Some people say more drowned than were, than were killed by the yeah. Scots. From the air, it's not only the size of the Bannockburn that's very clear. Its dramatic twists and turns would have been a nightmare for the fleeing English army to cross. That mud is as treacherous as the water. Yeah. And you can see this side of it, you can see all this marshland as well. Yeah. So it's not just the burn itself, it's the ground next to it that's a treacherous place. So if the English army got itself with no option but to try and get its way back across that water, yeah. it's got no, way, no chance of doing yeah. it. No. Not heavily armed men, all that equipment. In a panic, no way. 
especially as it breaks up, men in all directions. Yeah. Further upstream, the Bannockburn remains a formidable barrier. Everywhere you look at the Bannockburn, it's a considerable obstacle to men and animals, isn't it? This bears any resemblance to what it looked like in the medieval period. It's a death trap. Look at it. Look at how look, deep it's cut. If you're looking for that great ditch that everybody goes on about, mm -hmm. every ten feet, it's a great uh -huh. ditch. Yeah. Dressed in armour, panicked. Yeah, impossible. It's hellish. It seems likely that here on the flat cars, bounded by the Bannockburn on the south and east and the Pell Stream to the north, is the site of the battle. It's time to dig for archaeological evidence. Welcome to the last Bannockburn 700 project, and the, the biggest yet. We're covering 30 hectares here. And if you can stick your hand up if you've got anything interesting, even if you're not sure, just stick your hand up and Neil or Tony will come along and just and give you a... And we won't know what it is either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For the final push, we've called upon the services of local metal detectors, volunteers and a British Army archaeology unit, Operation Nightingale. Staffed by soldiers injured in the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, it serves as a form of occupational therapy. And for us archaeologists, they give a valuable soldier's perspective. They can bring a unique insight into a battlefield. What is it like to be there when you're under threat, when your life's in danger? If something goes wrong, where are your extraction routes? The most difficult thing to do in, in, in any battle is the extraction away from the enemy. And of course, that was one of the key elements of Bannockborn. How did the, the English army extract? And what happened? It strikes straight as ironic in a way that you've moved from modern battlefields to a very, very old battlefield uh, in one jump. Yes, um, and it's, it, is, it is quite surreal. You just look around and you think, you know, what was going on here 700 years ago? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, just absolutely r ridiculous the amount of people that must have died. I imagine digging trenches isn't new to you then. <laughs> no, but the difference is I'm enjoying it now and I've, I've not got somebody shouting at me. <laughs> That's good. So. We won't be doing that anyway, mate. <laughs> Carry on. Thanks yeah. very much. Anything worth... Oh, I was about to say anything worth reporting, but good grief. Oh, dancer. You know what that is? I think possibly a pendant. Exactly, a horse pendant. Hold your horse. As with all the objects we unearth, they'll need forensic examination after the dig. That could be one of our bits of horse furniture. It's one of the best things I've ever seen you find. It has, it has. I must agree with you, Eric. I must agree with you. Stick with it. Hey, archaeology is fun, Dr. P. Lee, how are you? And there's really one find it, that shows particular promise. What have we here? Oh, what on earth? Has this just come up? Yeah, definitely. Just up here. What? Good grief. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Good Lord. <laughs> you do, from the medieval period, get crosses hanging from horse harnesses right. and it does look as though you've got the, yeah, the very tip there. of a hanger there. I would guess that this is again another part of horse furniture, probably from one of the English horses. These crosses are definitely a feature of medieval horse harness yeah. and as these guys are fleeing back across the burn, um, there's no doubt that this stuff's going to be falling off. It's going to be absolute panic and I think we're getting a picture of that now. That's superb. I think we've got a, a snapshot of the later stages of the Battle of Bannockburn here. I think it's stunning. Well done, Lee. Yeah, thank you very much. Fine. What's beginning to emerge is possible evidence of the last moments of the battle, when the English army fled from the field towards the Bannockburn. Could you imagine, you know, you might have 7,000 people trying to get out here. It's not going to be pretty, is it? It's a race for survival. People at the start 
will probably have a better chance to survive yeah. than people at the end. Yeah. And to Sergeant Dermot Walsh, the archaeological finds fit the picture of an army on the run. So your likely armoured troops, maybe your, your archers, your skirmishers, yeah. have a better chance of survival. Your heavy armoured troops would have struggled there. They might have fallen, yeah. once to get down, it's very difficult to get back up. And also, of course, as you can see now, it's getting very wet. You're now starting to get out. If you were to start, there's still grass there, you get a grip. Yeah. If you've had a couple of thousand people come through, this would turn into a mud bath. Horrendous. You'd be slipping, you'd be sliding, you'd be trying to gain purchase to get at the other side, you'd be getting rid of your kit. Yeah. Anything that's loose will be falling off. Stunning. For the first time ever, I'm able to talk to somebody about this being a real scenario and not hypothetical. And that, for me, is a stunning breakthrough. After the initial excitement of the dig... What have we got in here? It's time to take a proper look at the finds. This is that thing we think might be part of a spur. Mm -hmm. The heel bit It's in really bad neck. We've got a horseshoe here. Possible scalloping on the edge, which would be indicative of a medieval horseshoe. This is a lovely little thing. Characteristic shield-shaped heraldic pendant. We've got this other little oh. crucifix or little cross. Yeah, I, didn't, I think this is possibly my favourite find of the whole thing. So we've got a, a fair selection of stuff, but we can't say anything definitive until we've had these mm -hmm. tests done. So I, I think in the first instance, if you can get them x-rayed, and we'll take it from there, really. Yep. To make sure the finds are medieval, Warren is taking the iron objects to be x-rayed, which will hopefully reveal the internal shape hidden beneath centuries of rust and dirt. Trying to find the medieval evidence of the battle is very, very difficult. The X-ray of the horseshoe is disappointing, as it's clearly 20th century. But the spur looks much more promising. And from that image, it looks like it's all one piece. Someone's probably hammered it from one piece. Hi, Effie. Hello, Tony. For the medieval pendants, I'm seeing Glasgow University's metallurgy expert. The analysis reveals that both heraldic objects are made out of copper. So pure copper, if we can. So, well, yeah, largely copper. But the cross appears to contain a more precious ingredient. One percent. One percent gold. So we're looking at something that is potentially a reasonably high status object then. There's clearly more to it than meets the eye once you start looking at the science of it. Yeah. Natasha, there's a couple of objects I would like you to look at. We were down. I'm hoping both objects are from the right period, but only Natasha Ferguson from the National Treasure Trove Unit can properly validate them. But it's not good news when it comes to the heraldic shield. They are shield shapes. I can see where that kind of comparison yeah. to heraldic pendants might come from. Um, but this is, this is definitely a, a 19th, 20th century um, saddle mount. You can see the iron rivets yeah. would, would have fitted onto the saddle. And also that shape, it's probably copying that style. But what about the cross? Oh, right. Oh, fantastic. That certainly looks like a horse pendant, medieval. Um, these date from the late 13th century to the 14th century. They've got quite a tight chronology. So right on our money, then, Absolutely, for the, for the yeah. Battle of Bannockburn. Your words are music to my ears. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's wonderful news. At last, something we can safely say is from the battle. Never before has the Battle of Bannockburn been so thoroughly investigated. Over two years, we've unearthed a staggering three and a half thousand objects. The soil of Bannockburn hasn't been kind to these finds. A lot are corroded beyond recognition, and most of these are only decades old. Oh. So amazingly, a handful from the right period have survived, and crucially, they are all related to cavalry. This looks very much like the heel end of a spur. I saw the th on the back so of a heel. That would go like that. And it's been it's been bent and distorted. Goodness. Mm -hmm. Now this looks interesting. It looks as though it's the base of a, a stirrup from the medieval period. We have something which is 
In a special box. In a special box because it is the star find. This is really the icing on the cake as far as the finds are concerned. Across. Look at that. Horse pendants are the quintessential piece of horse furniture from the period. Now, if we look at this picture here, which is from a manuscript from the 1300s. Oh, right. And hanging from a there they are, across the horse's chest, three of them. And there, on the horse's headband, is another one. It's forehead. And I think we're very fortunate to find what we have. So that's essentially a miracle. It's a miracle backed up with a hell of a lot of really hard work. And the thing is, it's in a great place because it's where we thought the English were most likely to cross the burn, both crossing over to give battle and then fleeing back right. as the battle goes badly for them. And it's in exactly that spot. The medieval cross, the spur and the stirrup were all found in this loop of the Bannockburn, dropped by English knights fleeing across the river to get away from the Scottish army. Ironically, the supposedly safe ground for the English chose to camp turned out to be their nemesis. I suppose ultimately what is wrong is that the English are simply not expecting mm -hmm. the trouble that they find themselves in. And so when the Scots come down towards them en masse, there's just not enough organisation in the English camp to get anything up and running fast enough to intercept it. I think you're quite right. I think it's the speed and clarity of the Scottish advance that mm -hmm. takes them on the back foot and if, as they're in camp desperately trying to position themselves. Effectively there's only one army on the field that knows there's going to be a battle mm -hmm. and it's the Scots. Now we know that the battle took place on the cars, we can make more sense of the historical accounts of that momentous day. Scott McMaster is a medieval historian and runs the National Trust for Scotland Battle of Bannockburn Centre. With the contemporary accounts to hand, he's going to guide us through the day's events. What do you think it is that makes the Bruce decide that rather than just holding the English and putting on a show in the face of them, when does he think, actually, I could take them? It's really when Sir Alexander Seton, a Scots knight fighting on the English side, he sort of defects, so to speak, makes his way up and informs Bruce that the English are in such a, a disarray. Bruce realises he's got an opportunity here. The generals are at each other's throats and he also realises that they're hemmed in between the Pearl Stream and the Bannockburn and this is a perfect opportunity to sweep down and so attack them. A position that had been quite understandable from the English point of view, be protected by the water, have the water for their horses, by the following day it's actually become a great it's problem. It's going to, yeah, absolutely, it's going to become a major disadvantage because they're hemmed in. And on the English perspective, though, they don't expect the Scots to fight. He's a guerrilla fighter. Why mm -hmm. should he? The, the, the very rivers are there exactly to protect them from any guerrilla attack. Using the contemporary accounts, we are going to restage what happened next. To help us, an army of experienced combat fighters called Clan Rannell combined with a visual effects team, will make sure the action is as realistic as possible. they be like well dogs in a pit. Clan Ranald is led by Charlie Allen, who has spent years studying Bannockburn. In the process, Clan Ranald has amassed an impressive collection of weapons and kit to bring Bruce's tactics to life. You don't want to die, OK? They don't want to die. So you're fighting for your life. Day two of the battle started at first light. While the English camp was still sleeping, the Scots crept silently down through Balquidderup Wood. into the morning light and lined up. To the astonishment of the sleepy English commanders, all of the Scots knelt down to pray. 
Kneeling for prayer is really essential from a military point of view, but it also gives them time to assemble, so to speak. It gives the captains each time to have a look around to make sure everyone's there. There's nobody rushing ahead suddenly in a bout of excitement to charge mm -hmm. at the English, or just to make sure that nobody's deserted, that they're all, you know, getting together and they're all in line and holding formation. Yeah. Across the cars, Edward watched the Scots kneeling. He took the Scots' piety as prayers for something else. The Scots almost devoutly knelt down and made a short prayer to God to help them in that fight. And when the English king saw them kneeling, he quickly said, Yonder folk kneel to ask mercy. The Scots quickly finished their prayers and started to advance towards the English. Across the cars, in the English camp, a round broke out between Edward and the Earl of Gloucester. Gloucester goes to the King Edward and explains to him that the men need some rest. And Edward II is not happy about this. He accuses Gloucester of treachery and almost cowardice. And this is obviously in front of the fellow Earls and some of the knights. But the King, growing very heated with him, charged him with treachery and deceit. Today, said the Earl, it will be clear that I am neither a traitor nor a liar, and at once prepared himself for battle. Gloucester, his 23-year-old young guy, mm -hmm. full of prestige, one of the most powerful men in England, his pride's dented and, yeah. and his honour's dented, so immediately he's enraged by this. He leaves and he says to himself, I'm going to prove a point to Edward. He jumps on his horse and, and rides straight at the Scots. Taking down a solitary knight is one thing, but it's estimated that Edward's cavalry numbered around 2,000. Scott, are these about the same size as medieval war horses? No, they're, they're actually a lot smaller than the, the medieval war horses. The war horses of the period were heavy and um, trained specifically for the main task of warfare. In battle, would the horses be armoured? Yeah, the comparisons are quite heavy to stop any sort of cuts and so forth. Some of them would be covered in mail as well. They're trained you know, specifically to fight in battle. So noises in terms of the elements of the steel on steel, the smashing, the splintering of whatever is going around about them, they'd be very much used to that. But it is purely a terrifying prospect. I, mean, I think we're all instinctively a little bit nervous around horses, the sound of hundreds of them coming in a line. Yeah, and you would feel the ground literally move as the, the hooves hit the ground and the, the vibrations come through. It's an effective weapon even now. So how did Bruce plan to break their charge using just foot soldiers? Robert's intention was to close the gap between him and the unprepared English as quickly as possible so preventing Edward's cavalry from building up enough momentum to smash the Scots line. This is really what Bannockburn is fundamentally all about, these bodies of men with their pikes and spears moving forward and jabbing forward, closing the gap between themselves and the cavalry so the cavalry can't fully deploy or can it race in and decimate the infantry. It's incredible. It must have been an incredibly daunting sight seeing that coming towards you. It, it was. You imagine that thing moving forward with the, the pikes jabbing towards you at every possible angle. I think we know a man that may be able to give us an idea of that, Charlie. Could we, uh, sure. possibly? Hey, you're going to have to give us some room. Oh. Arms up! <laughs> Shoot information on three, one, two, three! 
The Scottish army then reached the English, engaging them along the entire front. The English knights now found themselves hemmed in between the Scots Chilterns and the mass of their own army. When the great horses of the English charged the pikes of the Scots, as it were, into a dense forest, there arose a great and terrible crash of spears broken and of war horses wounded to the death. Bruce's children pushes forward, and of course the English are hemmed in between the Pell Stream and the Bannockburn, so there's not much space for them to move at all. Uh, and then slowly but surely, of course, what happens is the, the horses and the cavalry are pushed back onto their own men. But as they're pushing forward, there is this, this crush, essentially, that happens, and you can just imagine it. The horses are coming back and the men are coming back, and these damn Scots are pushing forward all the time, just piercing horse flesh, piercing armour, pushing them back all the time. It's almost like a combine harvester, just yeah, cutting, cutting back, chewing them up. Although in this case, it's a prickly hedgehog of spears. Pushing forward, the Scots soon began to gain ground and chaos broke out in the English ranks, with many dead and wounded being trampled. The whole army was slowly but surely driven back towards the Bannockburn. Now the English in the rear could not reach the Scots because the leading division was in the way, nor could they do anything to help themselves, wherefore there was nothing for it but to take to flight. Was there never an opportunity for the English archers to deploy and start wearing down the, the Scots? Well, it, it is mentioned in Barber's Bruce, the detachment of English archers. And they're seen to by Keith's cavalry. There's 500 light cavalry coming and decimate them. But the reality is, because the English are really caught on the hop, that there's no room, as we've already seen, for them to, the archers to actually do deploy. So there's no room for them either? No, I mean, we're standing together. How on earth would you, even if we are in ranks, how, would we, how are you going to loose your arrow from this distance if there's so many horsemen ahead of you as well and you've got this thicket of spears coming towards you too and this guy's moving about trying to get position there's just no way for them to deploy themselves it is amazing isn't it that even if you've got uh, an overwhelming number of fighting men if you can't deploy them then they're simply yeah. they, they simply become a hazard to themselves yeah, exactly. to each other yeah. Yeah. they're not a danger yeah. anymore they're just they're just in each other's way you've got those two super weapons the heavy horse and the archers and both are absolutely useless in this battle. But the biggest threat to the English troops was the Bannockburn. The English army as an organised fighting force had ceased to exist. Now in retreat, they are forced to recross the river. Many fall in a section named by the chroniclers as the Great Ditch. Come more of a seeing English. It's all gone very badly wrong for someone. Can you imagine thousands of men trying to do the same thing? Because if you if you walk, if you ran onto that steep side in armour, chain mail, you'd never get off it. Not for thousands of people, but you know it's like a football crowd. Robert the Bruce had defeated Edward. And it came at a huge price for the English army. Many nobles and others fell into it.
with their horses in the crush, and many were never able to extricate themselves from the ditch. Thus, Bannockburn was spoken about for many years in English throats. Reports on fatalities vary immensely. At least 150 of Edward's knights were killed, while the death toll of the English foot soldiers was in the thousands. There is no record of the Scots' casualties, but we can assume their losses would have been significantly fewer. What about the English king? Sensing imminent defeat, the party looking after Edward grabbed the reins of his horse and dragged him off the field and fled towards Stirling Castle. But Edward wasn't exactly received with open arms. After the battle, when it's all gone pear-shaped for Edward, he doesn't really have any place to go apart from the castle. Surely, though, even his most pessimistic predictions wouldn't have allowed for making a run for it from the battlefield of defeat. He didn't expect to lose, that's for sure. And then when he does come up here, the, the remnants of the garrison up here give him what I would say is pretty sound advice, which is, you do not want to be coming in here. And he eventually ends up in Dunbar, where he gets a ship down to England, but not a happy ending for him. No, the ignominy of it, even turned away by his own men. The Battle of Bannockburn secured Robert the Bruce's future as ruler of Scotland, but he had to wait 14 years for Edward II's son, Edward III, to recognise Scotland as an independent kingdom and Bruce as its king. He died just one year later, in 1329. It's amazing how many people still imbue it with such significance. Oh, it means so much. It does mean so much to so many, hence the statue behind us. But the thing is, the battle didn't really settle that much. It didn't mean that Scotland had won its independence. Edward II didn't recognise that. What it did do is establish Robert Bruce's reputation as king within Scotland. But the wars of independence rumble on. I suppose basically what Bannockburn did was it was part of what secured the legend of that man there. Yeah. It makes the name of Robert Bruce immortal. Overlooking the Bannockburn, Bruce had made his plan to defeat Edward, to force the English army onto the cars and push this mighty force towards the burn. In the end, they had nowhere to go. And it's on the banks of the Bannockburn where the fleeing English left their trace in the landscape. But for us, the battle's over. It has been a challenge, there's no doubt about that, but we do now have the first tangible evidence for the Battle of Bannockburn. Small in quantity, but high in quality. That's a good enough result for me. Take a peek behind the scenes of the filming on the quest for Bannockburn at bbc.co.uk slash Bannockburn. Next up tonight, communicating the art of everything, explore the unique world of Ryan Gander on The Culture Show. <laughs>